Hi, we're having so much fun exploring in and around Javier, but before we show you that, we want to show you how we got from Australia to Spain. In this episode of Sailing ABC, we get to experience what it's like to fly business class on our 35-hour, 18,600-kilometre journey from Brisbane in Australia to Javier in Spain on Etihad Airways. After our emotional farewell to our son Luke, Ansha and I headed for the Etihad check-in. There was a short delay before the check-in opened, which allowed us to regain our composure. Then it was through to see what it's like to travel business class with all the bells and whistles. Once inside the lounge, we relaxed into some comfy chairs, poured ourselves a couple of drinks from the self-serve bar and plugged our phones in for a recharge. Our plane for this leg of the journey was a Boeing 7879 with 28 flat bed pearl business seats and 271 standard Coral Economy class seats. Okay, so this is the uh, next leg of the adventure. It's exciting, just about to get on the plane. Yeah, just got priority check-in, which is nice. And priority been boarding. in the business section in Air New Zealand, it's really nice. Yeah, so it's all good? Yeah. As business class ticket holders, you get priority boarding, and I have to admit, I had a huge grin on my face as we entered the airplane and turned left instead of right. The business class seats offer a 6 foot 1 inch full flat bed, direct aisle access from every seat, a 15 inch LCD screen, noise cancelling headsets, in-seat power sockets, in-seat massage, luxury comforters and pillows. And I can tell you, all of that comfort makes a huge difference as to how you physically feel when you get off the plane at the other end. Is it expensive? Yes. Would I do it all the time? Yes, if I had the money. The first leg of our journey had a flight time of 14 hours and 20 minutes and we landed in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates six minutes ahead of schedule at 6.39 a.m. So, just done a 14 hour flight, yep. we landed in Abu Dhabi on time, uh, it's pretty dark outside, it's just about just after six in the morning, so um, we're about to find the lounge and uh, settle in for about an hour and a half, maybe two hours I think. I think so, yeah. yeah and then uh, take the next step which is only eight hours flight. Yeah. All right. All right. See you soon. Our stopover in Abu Dhabi was a short two hours and 25 minutes and after clearing in there was just enough time to hook into the free Wi-Fi, eat, drink, shower and go through security to board our next plane which would whisk us off to Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. At 8.20 a.m. we were welcomed aboard the Etihad Boeing 777-300ER by the ever smiling crew. First on your left, please. Business seats on this aircraft are split into two sections. Forward of the door there are eight seats in a one two one configuration and I was in seat 6C which was luckily a window seat. Once again my jacket was taken and hung up, champagne and hot towels were offered and we settled in ready for departure at 9.05 a.m.
Right on schedule, we landed at Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris, which was shrouded in thick fog created by the 5 degrees Celsius temperature. The plane taxied a long way and paused before crossing live runways, taxied some more, crossed over a two-lane road via a bridge, and then taxied some more. It was the longest airplane taxi I have ever had, all done with visibility down to just five meters in some places. I'm not a nervous flyer, but in the back of my mind was the memory of the deadliest accident in aviation history, in which 583 souls perished when two 747 aircraft collided in fog at Tenerife's North Airport in 1977. Once through security, we boarded a bus for a six-minute drive to our departure terminal somewhere in the fog-shrouded confines of the airport. We arrived at the departure terminal and went through passport control and entered the fray of humanity that I haven't encountered for 20 years. In Australia, places never really get crowded. It's just too big of a country with very few people. But we weren't in Kansas anymore, Toto. We were in one of the busiest airports in all of Europe where people barge past, refused to move to let you through, and only the strong and determined win. Luckily our gate was only a short distance and as we got there priority boarding had just opened up so it was with great relief that we showed our boarding passes and walked down the passenger boarding bridge. Final aeroplane. This is Tinsy Mincy Air France one. It's going to take us two hours to get to Valencia from Paris. Hopefully it's a bit warmer down there. This plane for the final leg of our journey was on an Air Europa Boeing 737-800 and it was disappointing. There was no turning left as we entered unless you were the pilot. Their idea of business class was to place a small drinks table in the middle seat of three. We did get offered champagne though and when the French guy in the seat behind me asked the smiling lady if he could have some too, he was politely told that it was only served to business class customers and he'd have to wait until a flight was airborne and trolley service was available. I had a little chuckle to myself. Still feeling fresh? Yeah, I am actually. I've <laughs> slept so well. It's been great. And no swell on ankles. <laughs> I'm sure that's because I was lying down and sitting up. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to the hour and a half drive when we get to the other end. Just when it gets to dusk, that's when the kangaroos come out and hop across the road and cause car, car accidents. I'm going to stop now. The flight time was only 1 hour and 40 minutes, so I decided to get some shut eye. We still had a 90 minute drive ahead of us once we landed in Spain, and I wanted my wits about me. It turned out to be a good decision. It was dusk as we exited the plane at Valencia Airport in Spain, found nobody manning passport control and only one very bored looking official sitting at the something to declare customs point. Unfortunately, two of our bags got left behind in Paris, but the nice lady at Lost Luggage arranged for them to be delivered to us in Javier the following day. Clutching our Lost Luggage ticket, Ansher and I exited the airport into a now dark night and boarded the shuttle bus that would take us to the car rental place. 15 minutes later, with our luggage loaded into the car, we set off for Javier. We didn't have our sat-nav, it was still in Paris, and we had no data on our smartphones. So taking the bull by the horns, I figured that if I stuck to main roads, there would eventually be a signpost which would either say AP7 to Barcelona or AP7 to Alicante. So we just drove, Ancha looking out for road signs and me looking out for Spanish drivers rushing to get home from work. At one point, we both looked at each other and Ancha asked if I was okay. So how are you feeling, Baz? I'm okay, I guess, um, but this is it. It's all part of the adventure. We're on the adventure. I know. <laughs> we're missing well, two suitcases. We don't know where we are or where we're going. <laughs> but we think we're getting there. But we'll get somewhere eventually. And eventually we did. After we'd been driving for 20 minutes, Ancha excitedly announced, there it is, there's the sign for AP7 Alicante. So with some relief, we entered the motorway and headed south. 
Driving on the motorway was a breeze after the Valencia traffic, and one hour and 30 minutes later, we took the turn off for Javier. Oh, there's a sign, so Javier is to the right, Baz. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. God, that was hidden. Well hidden, that wasn't it? <laughs> you see how far away it was? <clears throat> Didn't say. Okay. So right here. Right, yeah. Yeah, here. Ah, it sneaks okay. up on oh, you. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, it says, look, Javier 8. We had a rough idea of where my brother Phil's place was. We'd seen it on Google Earth and Google Maps, and we also had the address stored on our phones. My plan was to find Javier Port and work backwards from there. What we hadn't counted on was that Javier is a maze of one-way streets. Might be a way through somewhere. Oh. Can you turn right here then? Or is this a... Yep. <laughs> wow. I get the guards even worse, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know that we're going to be able to get out of here, are we? Can we hang on a minute? Okay. No, it's no entry. Well, how do you get out of here then? I don't know. Maybe you go down the other one. Up. Come on up here. Hang on. No. <laughs> Can you go there and reverse it in this oh, little thing? Okay. And then. down here. Oh. This looks okay. Uh, don't know if it goes anywhere, but yeah. It's going somewhere. God. These must be like the original old roads, do you think? Very small, aren't they? Yeah. Okay, well, you no can't go that, that way, way, so I turn right so here. Right here? Yeah. And stop. And stop. Oh, look. Look, isn't it pretty? <laughs> Scary, because we don't know where we are. Okay, we can pretty. only go right here. Okay, well let's go right then. I reckon we should go right. Eventually I stopped at a late opening big supermarket, and once again using my rapidly returning Spanish language skills, I merged with the mud map. As is going to our directions in Espanol. Espanol. Okay, good luck. Woohoo! Are we close? Are we close? No, it's open. It's no, it's are open. we close? Oh, we're very close, yeah. Oh, oh yep. good, good. It took two managers to uh, figure out the, the way, yeah, but yeah. it's just around the corner. Oh, sweet. Phil's place was just a three minute drive, and once we got there, we realised that we'd actually driven past it twice in the dark. Okay, so let's get the key before we get the bags out. Yeah, let's. Hang on, let me get my handbag. And um, we'll get that sorted out and yeah. then we'll come and get the bags. Alright. I tell you what, I could do with a wee. <laughs> the keys to the apartment are kept locked away in a coded lockbox near to the front door, and I eagerly put in the code. It didn't unlock. I swirled the numbers around a few times and tried the code again. Nothing. By now I was having visions of Ancher and I spending the night sleeping in the car as the temperature slowly descended to the predicted low of 4 degrees Celsius. I called my brother Phil in the UK and was greeted by his message service. As I later found out, he wasn't feeling too well that day and had turned off his phone and gone to bed early. And uh, it's not unlocking. So um, if you get this message, can you give me a call back on this number? One last chance was to phone my other brother in the UK. Thankfully, Steve answered after a couple of rings and was no as perplexed as I was that the code didn't work. He said he'd make some inquiries and call me straight back. I hoped he wasn't relying on a phone call to Phil to get it sorted. Eventually, Steve came back with a new code, which to my great relief was correct, and we had the keys. Ha -ha! Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right, bro. Yep, I'll, um, I'll call you, uh, well, I'll email you or call you tomorrow. Yep, we've got the keys. Okay, see ya. So here we are, 18,600 kilometers and 35 hours later, at 8.30 p.m. local time, surrounded by our bags and getting our priorities right by doing nothing else but opening a bottle of red wine and toasting ourselves on a job well done. Cheers. We made it. well done. Let's go and get the bags, <laughs> get that bottle of red wine and get it open. Sounds like a plan. Yep. All right.